Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community, from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, amen. Y'all give them a hand. Amen. What a great song to end on this morning as we continue our series on the names of God as we're talking about peace this morning. What is peace? You ever wonder that? I mean, over this next year, we're going to be hearing a whole lot about peace because there's this thing called the presidential election, uh, in case you didn't know, um, that's going on. And so we're going to hear all these promises of world peace uh, next year that if I get elected, I'll solve the Middle East and I'll solve Africa and I'll solve everything. And so we'll hear a whole lot about that because that's what happens every four years. All the promises are made. And, and so those things happen because I think we live in a world that longs for peace. I think there's something in us that, that the world's been trying to figure out this whole thing of peace since mankind was created. In fact, uh, while talking about loving one's neighbor, uh, Michael Romston was doing a exercise, and I almost thought about doing this exercise this morning, but I gotta be honest with you, there's something about these exercises where you close your eyes and you meditate and you dream of a place that there's something as me as a man I don't like doing. And so uh, I thought about all you guys out there of men that said, you know, I ain't closing my eyes in a room this size, amen. And, uh, and I know some of you guys, my, I, got, I got a good friend of mine that when, when we do these type of exercises at conferences and that kind of stuff, he just geeks out. He loves that meditation, closing his eyes and visualizing. So, so I'm not going to have you do that this morning, but the exercise was, uh, as he was getting these guys to do it, just close their eyes for a couple seconds and picture a place in your mind of peace. So they said they went around the room and, and gave everybody a chance and had everybody open their eyes and they began to share. Well, what did you see? What did you see when you had your eyes closed? And everybody in the room described a place, a mental picture of peace, and every one of them had something in common. There were no people in it. <laughs> and I got to admit, when I read that study, I went, yeah, that's definitely peace for me. Amen. He come in and it's kind of interesting when asked to imagine peace, the first thing we do is eliminate people. <laughs> get rid of the drama, right? I mean, is that all there is to peace? It's just getting rid of the drama? I think one of the ways we can answer what peace is, is we can answer what peace is not. Because a peace that in our life is more than a truce. It's more than a ceasefire, so to speak, because some of you and your family chose a ceasefire years ago, and, and you know what's coming in two weeks, don't you? Thanksgiving. And even though you chose a ceasefire, Thanksgiving Day is not going to be peaceful, but nobody's going to say anything, right? It's just going to be that awkward moment at the table. Because if Trump gets brought up or Hillary gets brought up and blood pressure goes up, amen? Is that too close? Because I mean, like two people said amen on that, right? It's like, I don't want to say amen to that. <laughs> you see, a lot of people just live in a ceasefire and it's kind of like the cold war in your home, you know, and you're not going to say anything to your wife, you're not going to say anything to your husband and not going to say anything to our kids and yet we call that peace, even though we're not talking to each other. And yet this name, as we're talking about the names of God, this, this name is Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is our peace. And I gotta be honest with you, never in our time in history, but probably never in the time of the church, is there ever a moment where I believe we need to understand this, of what true peace is. The word shalom means wholeness or completeness or well-being. I think that's interesting because over the last couple of weeks, I've been drawing this picture. I wanna put it up on the screen. 
is that this whole idea of Matthew 22, 37, where it says, God, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that we're made up of the spiritual and the emotional and the physical, that, that I believe that Jesus wants us to be whole. And isn't it interesting that the very name that, that he talks about peace means wholeness, a completeness, a well-being, knowing that our emotional and our spiritual or physical affects our spiritual state of mind. And also that our spiritual affects our emotional and physical. But as I've told you over the last couple of weeks, somewhere along the way, we divorced being spiritual from being emotionally and physically mature. And yet I believe Jesus wants us to be all of those in wholeness, having things properly aligned, a harmony, a balance. And it's more than just feeling good at a particular moment. You see, I could change all of your happiness in this room this morning. Do you know that? Happiness is different than peace because if I give you enough information this morning, for instance, if Carrie was serious and loved Jesus and wanted to go to heaven and really wanted to buy me that bass boat, it would change my happiness. Can I get an amen? amen. I'm just telling you, I would skip out of this room today and I don't skip. Amen. I'm just telling you, that would change my life. If a 21 foot bass boat, 250 horse, dual poles in the back, all the Atlanta, not that I'm describing that or thought about that at all. Amen. <laughs> it would change everything. See, here's what I also know. If I'm not careful, I can give you enough bad or negative information that I can steal your happiness. That I can steal your happiness. Not with peace. Because peace isn't tied to circumstances. There's something about peace that's not tied to circumstances. That's why in Israel today, when we were in Israel in 09, and we were walking along the streets, and we were, we were knowing that full well that the week before, they were dropping bombs out into Israel, that you would walk around and talk to Israelis, and Israelis would say, Shalom, in the midst of a country being at war, they're walking around in peace. Because there's something tied to the inside when peace is not tied to circumstances. You see, a person who's at peace is stable and calm and orderly. They're whole. There's something about that. Being at peace doesn't mean being calm when everything is around you calm, because that's when you should be calm, right? So what's the big deal if you're at peace when everything else is at peace? You see, being at peace means you're at rest even when everything else seems to be going wrong. I love what Jesus said in John 16, 33. He says, these things I've spoken to you so that in me you may have what? Peace. Say it with me. In me you may have peace. peace. In the world you're going to have tribulation, but take, take courage. I've overcome the world. In other words, here's what Jesus said. You can go ahead and expect to have a bad day, a bad week, a bad month, a bad year. Welcome to Summit Heights. Okay? That's what Jesus said. Hey, you can expect that because we live in a fallen world and we're fallen people being redeemed and having been redeemed by Jesus. And so guess what? You're gonna have bad days, bad weeks. Like Danny DeVito in that commercial where you need a Snickers so you turn from him to a little girl. Yeah. Jesus reminds us that peace isn't defined by our circumstances. It's one thing for the world to fall apart. It's a whole other thing for believers in Jesus Christ to fall apart because Jesus said, listen, I have overcome the world. And I'll give you peace. See, you can't control the world as much as some of you try. As much as some of you try to manipulate it on social media and try to state your opinion on everything that comes across the screen, God bless you. So I got off because of you, amen? Whoever you are. You're trying to control the world or you're trying to control world peace. Isn't that a little large for you? See, you can't control the world but you can control how we respond to it. To have peace when we have problems. To have peace so that our problems won't have us. Because see, relationships are gonna falter. You know, Danielle and I uh, spent almost four years without having an argument until about three weeks ago. Yeah, and it shocked us. That here we were, we, we were on this long run, man, and it was really good. And then all of a sudden, it's like, what happened? Because relationships have struggles, they're messy. Jobs cease, jobs end. If you've ever been laid off, you know that. 
your health, there's a good chance that everybody in this room, in fact, a one in one chance that everybody in this room is gonna die. Well, now you're really glad you're here, amen? Because health is going to end. We're in that process. The economy could dip again. You realize it does that every once in a while. If you've lived long enough, more than about 20 years, amen? It's gonna come and go. But take courage, Jesus said, because I've overcome the world and all the circumstances. So that brings us to a big question. How do we enter into the name of God, Jehovah Shalom, right? How do we enter into that? How do we, how do we move from this place of just no peace to a place where we begin to experience peace? And I believe it simply comes down to this, that we stand firm in our connection to Jesus Christ. You see, as a church, everything is centered on the Lord Jesus Christ, the crucified Christ, the one who died for us and hung on a cross and took our sins. By the way, do you know his body became a grave for sin? Yes. Isn't that good? His body became the grave for our sin so that you and I could enter into that relationship and be at peace. Yes. That he ushers in the light where there once was darkness. We overcome our situation. You overcome it in him in Jesus. It's like when Peter was walking on the water. You remember that story? What a great story. When Peter was told, get out of the boat. He goes, that's you, Jesus. Well, if that's you, you tell me to come on. He's like, well, come on, big boy. Peter, well, he jumps out of the boat. And he is spot on, locked on to Jesus. Not that you're Jesus, okay? Um, either one of you, you're both shaking your head like, yeah, I could be Jesus. Um, anyway, <laughs> they were like, hmm. He locked on. When did Peter lose his peace? When he looked away. There's something there. For those of us who know the name Jehovah Salaam, there, it brings something that eludes so many of us today. It, 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 when we take our eyes off Jesus, for those of us who claim the resurrected Christ, for those of us who claim Jesus as our Lord and Savior, when we take our eyes off him, we lose something called rest. You see, Shalom tells us that the secret to victory over life's drama is God himself. I love Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Come to me, he says. All who are weary and heavy laden, Jesus invites us. And he says, I will give you, say it with me, rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart and you'll find rest for your souls. You know, if it was an app, iYoke, you would all download it, wouldn't you? You would just grab it. Because we're always looking for the simple fix, aren't we? It's more than the simple fix. It's fixing your eyes on Jesus. And I don't know about you, but often my thoughts disrupt my peace. You ever have those days? Sometimes it's just a matter of opening my eyes in the morning. And my thoughts will disrupt my peace. I'm like, how does that happen? I've been, I've been asleep all night and the moment I wake up, Something as simple yet profound as realigning my thoughts with the truth of who Jesus is can change everything. Amen. So you got to transform what you think. Now go back to that diagram that I drew you a couple of weeks ago. You see, if we're going to realign the emotional and the physical, see there's a temple maintenance that comes along with our emotional and spiritual that we, we take care of our body. But that word repent is us realigning our mind, what we think, because that word repent is the Greek word metanoia, which means to change your mind. See, some of you need to change your mind about your circumstances. Oh, they stink. Oh, they stink. I get it. But there's a metanoia that takes place as we change our mind, as we realign our mind with Jehovah Shalom. You know, the first time we find this verse is, and this name was back in Judges. If you don't know anything about Judges, the book of Judges was back before Israel had kings and before King David came along and they were living in the promised land. You remember they came out of Egypt and they were living in the promised land and God told them, guys, if you go into the promised land, you trust me, you'll defeat everybody. And so we have this cycle going on in the book of Judges and it's interesting because there, there's seven cycles that covers about 350 years of Israel's history. It's, a, it's, 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 it's almost 25% of the 
their history in the Old Testament that they're, they're, they're in the promised land and there's this crazy thing going on because Israel got to this point. In fact, throw that uh, graphic up there, guys. Israel had this point where they would have peace in the land and Israel would serve the Lord and then Israel would decide, you know what, I'm kind of done with that for a season. And so they would do evil in the eyes of the Lord and then God would punish Israel and Israel would be enslaved and Israel would cry, cry out to the Lord and God would raise up a judge and then Israel would be delivered and they'd be at peace again and then Israel decided to go sin and they'd do it again and this just kept going over and over and over. It kind of sounds too close to home, doesn't it? But anyway, it just kept going over and over again. And so we find this in this, this uh, uh, passage where in Judges 2.19, it said, but it came about when the judge died. See, this is, he's describing what they're doing. So that when the judge died, that they would turn back and act more corruptly than their fathers. In other words, they wouldn't just do what their fathers did. They would do even more because isn't that what we do? Okay. And following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. And they did not abandon their practices or their stubborn ways. And finally, God would just go, that's enough. He'd sell them into slavery. It's amazing what we're capable of when we remove God, isn't it? It's amazing the ideas we can come up with when we remove his holiness, his peace. It's amazing what we will justify in our marriages and our finances when the unspeakable things that we'll come up with when we remove God. In chapter six, we find Gideon in Israel. And they were kind of in this cycle and their problems. And their big problem was this group called the Midianites. And the Midianites had attacked the promised land. And the text says they were like swarms of locusts. So here's what would happen. The Israelites would grow their crops and they would get all their stuff going. And the Midianites would come in and just wipe out everything. And so they, this cycle was going on. They would grow and the Midianites would destroy. They would grow and the Midianites would destroy. And finally, Israel just kind of went into hiding because that's kind of what they did. They would go into the caves and they would hide and they'd get away. And they, they would go in the holes in the ground because they had not paid any attention to God. They weren't honoring God. And so God was like, look, I don't care what you do. I'm just going to send the Midianites in. They're going to wipe it out. They're going to be like a bunch of locusts. They're going to take everything. And God came to one of the most unlikely characters in all of Israel named Gideon. And here's what happened. Look at it. Genesis, Judges chapter 6, verse 11. It says, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah and, b- that belonged to Joash the Abezerite. How do you like those names? Where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Now, I want you to get the picture here because he was threshing wheat in a wine press and, and, and the wine press in those days were a hole in the ground. It wasn't very big. It wasn't something you would think about threshing wheat in the hole because usually you thresh wheat out in this open area. So as you thresh the wheat and the wind would blow it, it'd blow it away the chafe. And so threshing wheat in a wine press is kind of like making coffee in a thimble. You know, it just, it doesn't make any sense. It's just this little bitty hole and he's making this... So you got this picture of of Gideon. This was not some superhero that God's come to. This is not some dude that you would think, I want to be like Gideon because Gideon was in a hole hiding from the Midianites. Got the picture? Now look at verse 14, 15. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? I love Gideon's response. Uh, pardon me. <laughs> All week long, I've been looking at that going, I just, I love, uh, uh, excuse me, Lord, um, I think you got the wrong guy. You ever said that to God? I think you got the wrong guy. Here's Gideon going, pardon me, Lord. Um, hello. I can't do this. How can I save Israel? And then look what he says. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And I am the least in my family. You think the brother had a self-image issue? I mean, think about this. He's sitting here and he's going, you got, a, obviously you don't know. I'm a wimp. I'm the weakest in my clan. They pick on me. Okay, I'm not your man. God said to Gideon in verse 16, the Lord answered, I will be with you. And you will strike down the Midianites, leaving none alone. Can you imagine hearing that? For Gideon, all of a sudden beginning to think not only that God knows him, not only with him, but also that God was for him. 
I mean, in that one moment where God comes to the weakest dude in the whole place, all of a sudden in that moment, he goes, I'm for you. I'm with you. I'm sending you. Look at verse 17. Let's keep reading. Gideon replied, well, (laughs) I just love this cat. Um, Now, if I found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it really is you talking to me. Now, I don't go away until I come back and, and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, okay, I'll wait until you return. So Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat uh, from the ephah of flour. He made bread without yeast. He put the meat in the basket and the broth in the pot. And he brought them out and he offered them to him under the oak. And the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on the rock, pour out the broth. And Gideon did. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of his staff that was in his hand. And fire, this is so awesome. And fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. And there it happened. It was at that moment Gideon's eyes were opened. It was at that moment that the angel of Jehovah in the midst of all of Gideon's doubts and all of that, it's like in that moment his eyes were opened. In that moment, he realized that was not an angel. That was God. That was God. Look at verse 22. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, alas, sovereign Lord, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Gideon was scared. Because you know what he knew? He remembered when Moses in Exodus chapter 33, verse 20, warned Moses, you cannot see my face for no man can see my face and live. And so at that moment, Gideon's like, he's looking for the lightning bolt, right? He's having a moment. He's having a meltdown. Oh, my, that, that was God. God opened his eyes and immediately, look at verse 23, but the Lord said to him, look at this, so good, peace. Let that set a minute. In this moment of his greatest fear, in this moment that he thought the end was done, look what God says. Look at the graciousness of our Father. Peace. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. You are not going to die. And you know, Gideon went, he passed out. He didn't know. I don't know he did. Can you imagine that moment, right? So Gideon, and this is so powerful. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it the Lord is peace. Now, don't miss this because notice that the Midianites were still their enemy. The Midianites were still destroying the crops. The Midianites were still out there. The Midianites were still ravaging the land. The Midianites were still overtaking Israel. And in the moment that he realized it was God, the problem had not been solved. But what did Gideon do? The thing I kid about this is, is yet before Gideon dealt with the issue in the physical realm, you know what he did? In that moment, he stopped and he worshiped. He built an altar. When's the last time you couldn't control what was going around you and you couldn't do anything and the world was crashing around you and you just stopped and worshiped? Oh man, come on. He made an altar to worship. And on that altar, he praised God for his peace. You are Lord God, Jehovah, Shalom. And the world was still chaotic around him. Nothing had changed. Nothing had changed. Yet God showed up. Listen, with God, you can experience peace in any situation, but without him, you can spend what you want. You can do what you want. You can go wherever you want. But listen to me, you will not have peace. That's why some of you sit here and you come to church every week and there's just something in you that's never settled. It's because you've never trusted Jesus. Some of you in this room, it's not settled because you know what you're living in is not holy. It's sin. And that needs to be confessed and surrendered. 
You see, the best you'll ever get is deflection. The best you'll ever get is a diversion or a distraction. But if you want true wholeness, despite what's going, wrong, uh, going around, it's only found in Christ Jesus, in his presence. All the odds change, expectations change, outcomes become dependent on him, and they're not limited to what you can do. That all of a sudden when we rest, when we put our eyes on him, you see, the first time we see God as Jehovah Shalom, we see it in the circumstances of a man in fear. His peace is disturbed. Not only was his peace disturbed, he, remember he was in a wine press threshing wheat. Not only was he disturbed, he was fearful of what was out there. And then all of a sudden God shows up and that scares the dog out of him. And yet we find in that moment when he thinks he's going to die, that when God opens his eyes, peace. And he begins to realize that he is a valiant warrior. If you go on and you read the rest of the story, you'll see what he does and what God does. He winnows down his army and, and ends up defeating the Midianites. It's a phenomenal story. I challenge you to read it, to go look at it. Israel rebelled against God. All through the book of Judges, we see this taking place. You know, Gideon didn't do it perfectly. In fact, if you read on, he... He then even test God again, give me a fleece. Well, that wasn't good enough, give me another one. It's not like overnight, just because he saw God, just because he understood peace, that everything from that point forward went great. He still struggled. But something changed. Something changes in us. You see, when Israel would rebel against God, and they'd go into enslavement, and their enemies would try up over them. You know, they'd, they'd come out of Egypt and God told them, look, if you'll honor me, if you'll keep your eyes on me, you'll defeat everybody in the promised land. And yet we find them in the book of Judges in rebellion, disobedience. The enemies that they were supposed to be defeating were defeating them. And kind of the tables had turned on the very thing that God said, listen, if you'll trust me, I'll give you the promised land. And the tables had turned because out of their disobedience, that all of a sudden now they were being defeated and they would be defeated and then cry out and God would rescue them. And, and, and it's kind of crazy that we look at that back then and we look at Gideon and we look at Israel and we go, man, that's crazy. But yet the, the similarities of them and us are almost uncanny. It's crazy. We're fearful, we're slow to not trust. Yet when we find we draw near to him, that he's there every time. Isn't that amazing? That when we draw close to him, he's there every time. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you from everlasting to everlasting he is Jehovah Shalom, our peace. That God gave Gideon his peace despite the circumstances and the chaotic world that he lived in, which comes back to that question, how do we, like Gideon, discover God's peace, that God is near? I mean, if it's presence, it's the key to our peace. How do we abide in it? Do we have to wait for Sunday morning where we come and, and we get goosebumps on goosebumps? Man, that music was good. That preacher's just the best I've ever heard. I know, okay. I'm kidding. Thanks, Nancy. I believe you. Amen. She's like mama to me. Amen. My mama's at home right now going, amen. That's my boy. <laughs> Do we have to wait till Sunday? You see, Paul's letter to the church in Rome, I think, gives us the secret. Look at it. Romans 8, 5 and 6. And look at the contrast. He says, for those who are according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, their mind is set on. For the mind set on the flesh is what? Yeah. Say it again. It's what? Yeah. But the mind set on the Spirit is life and what? Peace. Listen, you can put your mind on everything in this world. Paul is saying this. If you want peace, get your eyes off the things you see on this earth. And get your eyes on the things that are unseen, Jesus. Get your eyes. Peace begins having a proper mindset. It's that divine presence that when we set our mind, that word metanoia means to change your mind and think like God. That's what Paul's talking about. Quit putting your mind on all what could happen. 
Some of you spend more time worrying about stuff that will never happen. But you worry like crazy. Instead of setting your mind on those things of God that God promises those to keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. As we begin to, to, uh, to uh, meditate on him. You see, it's a mindset that peace is the outcome when our mind is stayed on him. And here's the principle. Listen to me. I want you to see this on the screen that disobedience disrupts peace. That obedience brings peace. And what accompanies peace is righteousness, right standing. Listen, the reason some of you don't have peace is because you're being disobedient to the Lord. You're allowing things in your mind and in your life and in your marriage and your finances and your job and all those things right now in your journey and you're lying about it. You're lying to yourself, your spouse, those around you, your small group. You're lying to your church. And listen, long as you're doing that, then there is no peace. It's only through obedience. And obedience starts with repentance. That we agree with God. And we change our mind to start thinking like him. You see the mind that's set on the spirit that seeks to align ourselves under God's point of view is the mind full of peace. But you got to set your mind there. You have to set your mind there. Y'all remember daylight savings time a few weeks ago when you had to set your clock back? Remember that? And and theory, we got an extra hour of sleep. How many of you guys actually stay up later on that night than anybody else like me? Because I'm thinking, oh, I get an extra hour. And then I lay down and I'm thinking, it's it's really 10 o'clock and it's only 9 o'clock. And then midnight, I'm thinking, it's really 1 o'clock, but it's midnight, right, right? And so I can't shut my mind off and all that. And and you remember the day, because I know some of you guys, you don't have that thing on your nightstand called an alarm clock anymore because you use phones, right? And so you don't have to actually set your clocks except for your oven, your microwave and everything else because they hadn't got that smart yet. And so you remember you had to set your clock back. And if you didn't, you were rudely awakened at the wrong time. You ever been rudely awakened at the wrong time? That'll set your mind at, uh, at no peace, right? I hate that when that happens. You see, if you're gonna get up on time and you're gonna do And you got to set your clock right. You see, the mindset on the spirit, that which seeks to align our thoughts underneath God's point of view, is the mind full of peace. So you got to set your mind there, Paul says. Or the alarm of life, the alarm of disobedience will wake you up. So you got to set your mind. Choosing whether to set your mind, just like choosing to set your clock. A mindset on God's presence. Just as Gideon's was, brings peace, even when the Midianites are still around you. But the mindset on the flesh is death. Listen, the mindset on flesh is death. Let me say that again. The mind that's set on flesh is death. And that's separation from God. So the mindset on the human point of view, the world's perspective, is what we would call a carnal mind, and it doesn't bring peace. But when you set your mind on the spirit, you develop a habit of abiding in him. Again, the principle's clear. Disobedience disrupts peace. Obedience brings peace. And peace accompanies righteousness. It's kind of like that internal clock. See, I don't have to set an alarm anymore. How many of you guys don't have to set an alarm? You just wake up, right? It's because for so many, I know some of you are like, dead gummit. You retirees in the room going, dude, I've been retired a year and I still get up at three. Yeah. (laughs) See, I don't have to set my alarm, but I do. But maybe you're like me. When you set your alarm, you wake up 10 minutes before. 51. 52, I really should go ahead and get up. Nope, I'm not, not until six. I'm waiting. 53, anybody else, you know what I'm saying? It's because your body's trained. Can I just say this to you? Just as all those years you wake it up the same time, you don't even need an alarm today. The same principle is true. The heart that's set on the spirit of God and the things of God all of a sudden, just become internal. Just who you are. Forgiveness just becomes who you are. Service just becomes who you are. 
kindness just becomes who you are. Love just becomes who you are. But listen, if you're not used to hanging out with God and setting your mind on the spirit, then some of you in this room, I'm telling you, this is where some of you need to do. You need to proactively set your spiritual clock on the things of God. See, Gideon wasn't the only guy who wrestled with this. You go back and you look at scripture, Abraham, Moses, Joshua, David, Elijah, Peter, all the disciples, everybody struggled with that. How many times did Jesus come to him and said, fear not, fear not. Don't be afraid. Why? Because I'm with you, he says. I've got this. And it's not found in an iyoke app. You can't just download it. It's the mind that's set on him. Does anybody else worry with, struggle with worry and fear in this room? In fact, I was reading in the New York Times a study that says scientists have found that in the human genome project that we have this thing called the worry gene. It's the SLC684 gene on the chromosome 17Q12. I'm not kidding. Okay. In fact, the people who have the short version of this gene are especially prone to worry. How many of you guys have the short version in here? Amen? Isn't that amazing? Now, here's what I'm telling you. Worry gets in our hearts. Fear gets in our hearts. In fact, someone looked at the average person's anxiety. Look at this. This is crazy. 40% of the things we worry about that will never happen, 30% of the things about the past that can't be changed. We worry about 12% of things that, about criticism from others, mostly untrue. 10% about our health, which gets worse and worse. And 8% about problems that will be faced. You see, sometimes we wake up and we're tempted just to worry. I'll sit at my desk in the morning sometimes. I get a Google email every morning at 5 a.m. that gives me my agenda. And some days I look at it and just... Well, crap. You ever say that? And then some days I look at Danielle and say, I'm going to eat all day. Man, this is awesome. I got a lunch and I got a breakfast. I got coffee and I got a dinner tonight and another coffee this afternoon. It's like, dude, this is awesome. Don't have many of those. <laughs> the problem is I'll sit at my desk sometimes and I'll look at all those things and all the outcomes that I can't control, my kids, my family, my relationships. And all these things are swirling and it's just all of a sudden I realign my mind. God, you're enough. I think that's why Paul said I can do all things. I can sit in prison while I write this. I can do all things. I can have the snot beat out of me on a regular basis and I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. <laughs> Nobody can give you this sort of peace except Jesus, to focus, to purposely focus on him, to set your mind on the things of Christ. And it's amazing what changes. It's amazing what changes when we'll set our mind on the things of Christ. Oh, it still may be falling apart. It still may be ugly. But to be at peace, to listen. And to set our, stay your mind on Jesus. Amen. He is the shalom, yes, is. our peace. Amen? Amen? Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. Thank you this morning that you're more than enough. That you are our peace. And you're the one that can bring rest. Lord, I pray for the believer in this room. That God, very honestly, there's, there's disobedience there that needs to be confessed. There's not peace. And God, I pray you give them courage this morning to bring what's in the darkness that you already know and you still love them out into the light. That they may deal with that and destroy that so that they may have peace and rest. And God, for those in this room that don't know you, God, they just struggle. Father, I pray this morning 
as they hear that you are bigger than anything they'll face, God, I pray that would get deep, bigger than their failures, bigger than their regrets, bigger than their sin and their guilt. God, I pray they would hear you saying this morning, if you'll let me, if you'll try me, if you'll open the door to your heart, I'll come into your life and I'll be your forgiver. I'll be your peace. Father, I pray you give life to someone this morning and give them courage as we respond, Lord, to maybe step out and grab one of these prayer warriors. Say, I need that. So, Lord, I love you. Thank you for the body, for the blood of Jesus Christ, for that body that became the grave for sin. (laughs) And you took it where it belongs, hell, and left it there so that we would no longer have to live under its penalty. And you rose from the grave. Thank you for dying for us. We celebrate you and worship you today by taking communion, the bread and the cup. We love you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, hey, let's. Hey, guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen, and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day, and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.